December 2020. It's a big day. It's the first official day of the campaign. The old cliche is that the presidential campaigns begin after Labor Day. Now, they actually began two years ago. Actually, they never stopped. The campaign against Trump never, ever stopped. And I'll be talking with Byron York about that in hour three today, about his brand new book, Obsession. And I would encourage you to get that book and read through why uh, President Trump's really enjoying the first year of his term right now in the last 60 days of it uh, because of the endless attacks, which continue, by the way. But uh, Byron does a fantastic job laying them out from the Comey to the Mueller to the Russia hearings to the Ukraine hearings and then the COVID attacks. But none of it really matters. All that matters is turnout. So I'm beginning today's first day of the official campaign by appealing to you to join the Job Creators Network effort, keepamericaamerica.com. It's a get out the vote effort. Go and sign up, do your part, get the vote out. The single most important thing you can do is to get your friends and family and coworkers and colleagues out and talking about what the Republicans have done what the president has done over the last four years, which is immense, and to talk down, frankly, the trash talk and the lies. I wrote a column about this on uh, Sunday. It posted yesterday. I see the president retweeted it last night, so that overnight it went to like 20,000 retweets, whatever happens whenever the president retweets something. But it was simply an... uh, I think persuasively written to focus on not this stupid story that someone says he said bad things about the military, but to his real successes like the Kosovo-Serbia deal. Did you know in the Kosovo-Serbia deal that Serbia agreed to move its embassy to Jerusalem and Kosovo, which is a Muslim-majority country, agreed to establish ties with Israel? That wasn't covered much at all, actually. And... While there was an occasional story here or there about what happened, the Kosovo-Serbia war was a bitter, brutal, horrible war that went on for as long as Yugoslavia fell apart and became all the different Balkan countries. And while not um, as obvious to Americans and to uh, Anglos as the Good Friday Accords between Northern Ireland as Protestants and Catholics, the deal between the Serbs and the Kosovars is a big deal in terms of peace. And so uh, after it was signed, the president, the president of Serbia and the prime minister of Kosovo all signed the, uh, the deal in the Oval Office on Friday. And it's a historic occasion, not unlike the UAE Israel Accord, which will be signed in Washington later this month. Uh, Ambassador Grinnell, who was recent up until recently the ambassador of Germany, walked out into the press room and just ripped into them. Cut number one. I'm going to just talk about Kosovo and Serbia. I don't know if you can find it on a map, but this is atrocious. I have to tell you guys, you might be too young to understand what this issue is about. Maybe the older journalists should step up and say, this is a big deal. This is a big issue. I'm astounded at what happens in Washington, D.C., and especially in this room. I, I got to tell you, get substantive. Maybe it's too complicated of an issue for you all. Rick, respectfully, but, this is the first time we've had the opportunity to speak with these individuals. Okay, but today's about Kosovo and Serbia. Let's take a little time and talk about this 21-year issue, Peter. I mean, 21-year issue, we're getting the same questions that are all politics. I don't, you guys don't understand what's happening outside of Washington, D.C. People aren't listening to you anymore. It, it's really a crisis in journalism. And I think it's because people are too young to understand issues like Kosovo and Serbia. All right, can I ask How about a, a substantive question? question? I don't think any of us came here for a lecture about our questioning. Okay, well, but, I didn't come but the here question I would like to ask you, the question I would like to ask you is... You know, Rick, um, that, that, that reporter may not want a lecture, but he came to the White House briefing room and Rick is the briefer. I don't know who the reporter was, and maybe he's a good guy, but uh, if the the fellow who negotiated Kosovo and Serbia along with the president and the national security advisor is appalled at the level of questions. That's a newsworthy event. And that clip got more traction than anything else. 
uh, maybe other than my column over the weekend, uh, my column coming in second by a lot. And I think it's because most of the country does realize they're not there in good faith. They're not covering the news. They're there to get Trump. And people have had it. Now, the Atlantic story that the president said awful things about uh, dead American soldiers in cemeteries around France, you can choose to believe it. It's written by a good reporter. Jeffrey Goldberg is a good reporter. But his sources are anonymous sources. And uh, I, have a, I have a theory. I don't know that it's true. I, I'm guessing two or three people who were on that trip as part of the staff of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, um, Joe Dunford, not Chairman Dunford, who would never, I believe, ever say something like this. But a couple of colonels or commanders or staff officers, maybe even one stars, get together and they decide to feed this to Jeffrey and to do it now. And so they do. And then they confirm it to AP, which they did. But Mike Pompeo, who is with the president, John Kelly's chief aide yesterday, Sarah Sanders Huckabee, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, who is with the president, and believe it or not, John Bolton, who of course has his problems with the president, the president with John Bolton, all denied that. In fact, John Bolton went on Fox News with Martha McCullum yesterday and said this, cut number two. According to what that article said, uh, the president made uh, disparaging remarks about our soldiers, the people buried at the On Marne Cemetery, uh, in connection with the decision for him not to go to the ceremony that was planned that afternoon. And and that's that was simply false. I don't know who told the author that, but that was false. And I recounted that in uh, in my book, Room Where It Happened, and, and uh, re- re- reaffirmed that in response to questions the next day. Yeah, I mean, you've heard the back and forth between reporters on this. Jennifer Griffin came on today and said that she stands by her sources. She says that you were not, quote, in the room where it happened when this was discussed. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, she's just flatly wrong. Look, I can tell you exactly what it was. We, we were in the ambassador's residence uh, in Paris. We were supposed to be having a 1030 meeting uh, to brief the president for his meeting with French President Emmanuel Macron at 11. Uh, uh, the president was late, which is frequently the case. I don't think the entire affair lasted more than 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, and the main issue was whether or not weather conditions permitted the president to go out to the on Marne Cemetery. Uh, the people I recall being there were John Kelly, one of his aides, Mike Pompeo, myself, uh, Jamie McCord, our ambassador to France. Uh, we had this discussion. It was mostly John Kelly presenting the logistical uh, reasons why the trip couldn't take place. Uh, and the president assented to the recommendation that he not go. Is it, that's just not a story. Now, he doesn't mention Dunford, so my theory doesn't get any backing from Dunford there. But um, Kelly's chief aide denied it. And I, I, Mike Pompeo on the show on Friday just said it was nonsense. So we spent the weekend talking about that instead of Kosovo. So yesterday, the president goes out and gives a press conference, which I'll come back to. But let me begin with a little market update, because it's going to be a wild day on Wall Street. The, uh, the early options on uh, 